Hey everybody, it's Damien Gerge from The Breakdown Show and today's guest is John Klein. John Klein is a producer and multi-instrumentalist. His career started in the 70s playing with several seminal and influenced bands in the post-punk family of genres. Apparently, he also likes to play in bands with DS, Susie, CNET, Shurik Back, Specimen, Space Drive. John's found success all over the world producing music for a variety of clients. He's charted in Spain with Fangoria and, among other things, currently plays in Miko and the Mellotronics. Pity Turner, John Leon Guerrero, and our favorite gunslinger Wes Maybe all join on this episode. Save the Brave, go to savethebrave.org and support our veteran tribe. Also, if you want to support the Breakdown Show, go to breakdownshow.com and donate to the PayPal link also. You can watch our videos on YouTube and you can buy our merch or you can simply subscribe on any podcast platform available. All right, enough of me. Here comes John Klein. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hi, this is John Klein, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, indeed. John Klein has been the guitarist in nearly a million bands uh, that you love, including Susie and the Banshees and Sinead O'Connor and uh, Nico and the Mellotronics. Uh, Robin Fink of Nine Inch Nails, with whom he shared a stage on the inaugural Lollapalooza tour, Called him a blend of Buster Keaton and Ace Freely, which I thought is the greatest compliment that another guitarist of, of your caliber could give you. What do you think about that comparison? That's great. Buster Keaton means Ace Freely. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have never come up with that one, but I could go with that one, yeah. <laughs> that is terrific. I hey, will uh, use I, that. We said when we uh, were off mic before we started that you and I have been in the same room. And that is with 52 other people. That room was the Shoreline Amphitheater in, uh, I believe, Sunnyvale, California. That was the uh, first Lollapalooza tour. And and it was a memorable one. Uh, What do you remember about the American leg of the Lollapalooza tour? Uh, Sorry, I've lost sound here. Is Uh that me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you very well. I, I can hear. We can hear you. Yeah. Are you guys still? Well, I'm going to ask John. Then. Hey, John, when you were at Lollapalooza, I remember when that show, that first time they announced that package, it was going to be a touring show and all those kind of things. We yeah. were all pretty excited. Yeah. Well, you know, the that was a yeah that was a, a, a really big tour. And for me, it was a lot of bands that I liked you know, where I grew up, it's pretty urban. So I was there to see bands like um, Body Count with Ice T and, mm-hmm. uh, and and Living Color was there too. But of course, Nine Inch Nails and Susie and the Banshees. And I think Nine Inch Nails headlined and Susie, Susie and the Banshees played right before. But the thing about that, um, the thing about that particular uh, tour for me, was it was one of my first dates with my wife of 25 years. Oh, that's great. By, by the way, John Klein, your microphone is not connected according to what I can see here. So I don't know if you know what he's, he's working on. Okay. Um, so you and KB get together and one of your first dates is to go to that show. Again, th- this show was exciting. This was, we had days on the green, but this was bigger than that. You know, yeah. like, like kind of the inaugural modern era of these giant music festivals. That's that's true. It was the first of the giant music festivals. And I would say that that one in particular, it was a huge guitar fest. I mean, there were so many great guitarists on that tour. I mean, we, you know, the aforementioned Robert, uh, Robin Fink uh, and, and John was there as well. But we also had um, Vernon Reed from Living Color was there. Um Oh, gone it. I can't remember the name of the guitarist from Body Count. It was Ernie something. Uh, I think it was Ernie Smith. And he was a monster of a metal player uh, and a black metal player. So we had him and Vernon Reed on the same tour. 
And man, it was it was a guitar fest all day long. And there were lots of, uh, you know, it was the first of the big music festivals. I mean, every time I go to something like Bottle Rock or something, I, I think back to that first Lollapalooza tour and what a mix of acts that was. Because the Days of the Green, you're right. I mean, you know, just prior to that, I think what I saw was Monsters of Rock, which was all hair bands. You yeah. Know? So that yeah. was the first time that we were, you know, there were a lot of people exposed to a lot of different other bands. So I'm sure that there were a lot of, you know, Body Count fans or Living Color fans who were seeing John there for the first time that day, like I was. I want to so, say this. Am, ahead, I back, am I back, by the way? Sorry about yeah. that. I, th I think the antivirus system on my computer just had a flip out and took me somewhere else for a second. So, so we're on Lollapalooza '91 at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, interesting stories about Lollapalooza '1991. I, th I think what we were talking about while you were gone was the mix of absolutely monstrous guitarists that were on that tour, and so yeah. many, uh, such a variety. Because I mean, really, I was there to see. Guitar wise, I was there to see Vernon Reed. I couldn't wait to see Vernon Reed right. with Living Color. And then just all day long, one after another after another, uh, you know, to culminate with uh, with you and Robin Fink, of course, the being the kind of co headliners. What do you remember about that tour? Well, well actually, now that you mentioned Vernon Reed, I, I do remember. Um, well, I met the Living Color guys early early on in the tour. I think it was one day we turned up and I was locked out of our porter cabin and, I, and and they let me in there so they were really hospitable and really nice actually but on one day we, we were in a changing room next to them in, in, a, in a building somewhere and I heard this monstrously loud guitar coming from next door and uh, so we, we kind of knocked on the door and Vernon Reed had his entire back line in their changing room. And, and it was his birthday. So I, 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 mean, I assumed that his birthday present from the crew was having this enormous kind of mess of boogie rig there. But apparently it was because they had a signal problem somewhere in his rack system. And they turned a the rack system around and there must have been 500 cables in the back of that thing. So I don't know if they got it sorted, but it was that. Quite a serious rig he had, actually. Um, no, he was very interesting. I mean, I don't know where to start on that one. That tour was absolutely insane. I mean, it kicked off in, what, Phoenix, Arizona was the first day. And I remember when Nine Inch Nails, um, they were running their show off, I think it was off a four-track TAC, and it melted in about the third or fourth song, which I think I think that was the end of, end of their show. And um, the, the what was the yeah oh god, I mean it it was chaos. I mean there's one point where um, early in the tour about a week in where we were all at the same hotel, and I remember as each when we got back to the hotel after our set, the Nine Inch Nails were in there and they'd sent out they were in, they were in the hotel bar and they'd sent out for some pizzas. So these pizzas came in, and and, and we're sat around and they're kind of like. Oh, oh, they've got pizzas. And Sue's like, where's mine? I want a pizza. So we ordered some pizzas in. And, and so, you know, there were kind of maybe three or four bands kind of in the next hour kind of sat there eating kind of third-party pizzas in this hotel kind of lobby, uh, what, what, at which point the night manager came down and started to get all arsy and uh, and started threatening to throw us out of the hotel. And it became this really interesting debate. It was like, are you seriously going to empty your entire hotel because of a dozen pizzas? So now they didn't do that in the end. But uh, that that was the fir first kind of tour party. And there was another one later on in the tour that got really messy. I can't remember. That. Was that maybe as it was kind of approaching Florida? So, because it was what ten weeks that tour. So there was mm. definitely, definitely kind of a, a a bit of kind of madness that kind of that was creeping up on that tour. So when when the big party happened, I remember I was um, in the queue for extras at the um, at the hotel checkout the next morning, and we you know, well, have had an hour sleep, if any sleep, whatever. And Budgie picked up his ex extras, and I think it was about. A grand and a half or something with some champagne that he accidentally ordered or so. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so we're going to get details. We got details about the pizza party, but the one that got super, super messy, the only thing you remember was a couple extra bottles of champagne. Okay, we see how you are. <laughs> but I, I'll actually, I'll, I'll tell you another interesting story for, was it? Yeah, that was that year when we got, when we went to Denver, Colorado. I think everyone got a bit of altitude sickness. It was all a bit nuts there. And, um, and, and I don't know, I got a bit of attitude on because at one point I told, you can't go in a change room. Someone's got a masseuse, a masseuse in there. And I was like, that's not very rock and roll, is it? Anyways, we get to our set and so, and everyone's, everyone's burning up in the heat and kind of like being a bit spaced out because the altitude sickness. And we had for an encore, uh, we'd kept time to do our encore number, which was a cover of um, Helter Skelter, the Beatles. And the Banshees had a rule was like, the only rule for that song was you're never allowed to rehearse it. So, but they'd asked Gibby and Paul from the Buttholes to, to come on stage and kind of do it. So I think I'd kind of uh, routine Paul, we got the guitar set up done. So, um, so we kick into Helter Skelter, there's no sign of Gibby. And then, you know, we're bam, 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 bam. First course is approaching. And suddenly this apparition materializes from the wings of this six foot six drag version of something from golden girls in a big floral dress and a huge ronald mcdonald styly wig and it's gibby haynes who then start, like walks center stage and starts doing a strip show i think he gets kind of gets down to the point where he pulls his pants off and he's got um he, he's got a Dr. Pe Pepper can gaffer tape to his dick, I think. It was absolutely, at which point, like, see where it's right, everyone get him. And we all piled on it. It was just ended up this big pile of bodies in the center of the stage with the guitar necks and stuff sticking out of it, going clang. Bing. It was that kind of like a bit of a performance art kind of, <laughs> yeah, Christian Markley sort of thing or something like Glenn Branker Orchestra. It was absolutely, yeah, there were plenty of messy moments on that. So I think, and the last, actually, the last one I'll, I'll tell you about was I think that was in Florida, and um, Nine Inch Nails were leaving the tour because they were heading off early because they're heading off to support Guns and Roses in Europe, and so they had this thing where their crew would hit every town when they arrived, buy a load of fifty dollar guitars, spray them all up, put them in a rack, and at a certain point, you know, it'd be grab a guitar, smash a guitar, and. Um, and, and Dave Navarro had just, he, he bought a video camera a couple of months earlier. It was before I had a video camera. I said, oh, John, you know, I'm going to go and smash a guitar. You know, can, can, can you video it? You know? I'm like, yeah, sure thing. Yeah. So, so I'm going to sit there with a the video camera in the wings, watching all these people marching on. And then I, I suddenly saw one, one of Ice T's posse, this huge dude in the LA Raiders t-shirt that didn't quite look like he knew where he was going. And I thought, oh, this could be interesting. I'll follow him. I'd soon be going him. And, and so I kind of filmed him and he's kind of walking towards me and then he walks past the rack of $50 guitars and then finds another rack that's got like, um, <laughs> that's got Trent Reznor's Vintage Explorers on it, I think oh. it was. Oh, I, no. think, I, I think he grabbed one of those and turned it into Matchwood. I don't uh. know. Maybe my memory is slightly out of focus, but that's the way I remember it. I do remember. I uh, remember Trent getting very upset. <laughs> Everything's dangerous in rock and roll. But yeah. A lot more rock and roll than having a masseuse in your dressing room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't happy about that one. I think, yeah, I was glad that my that my remaining memory from that was um, Gibby Haynes and his Dr. Pepper can. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Hey, uh, we were just joined by the Wesonator, our homeboy uh, over there. And, you know, you introduced us to John West. Uh, what have you guys been working on? Oh, uh, what have we been working on? Uh, well, we've done we've done some stuff with the, the Lasso the Moon guys who were on the show a while back, mm -hmm. um, and and you know amongst other things, we've we've got some stuff coming up as well. So uh, yeah, we'll yeah, let you know when it happens. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun, fun to do some kind of lockdown projects actually, because uh, yeah, it's a different kind of set of rules that one. Yeah, I mean that set of rules you were operating on on the road is uh, that's exemplary. And when you get locked down, you got to get creative to get anything uh, anything nearly as fun. What what have you been doing in lockdown, and what direction did that take for you? 
Well, that, well, that one was really interesting. The first thing that Wes punted over is like, oh, we're going to do a version of Bowie, Moon Age, Daydream. And I'm a massive Mick Ronson fan. So it's yeah. just like, for me, that's, it's just like playing a national anthem or something. So we, <laughs> we had a lot, a lot of fun. And just, but it's always, I love doing covers because you're suddenly listening to it a lot close and, and actually kind of going back, studying and breaking down the production. Um, on Ziggy was really interesting. You know, certainly the guitars were either a lot more stripped back or the dynamics were a lot more subtle than you kind of, than you remember in a way. So it was yeah. uh, now re really good. So we kind of, you know, because we started out doing what you think it is and then you go back and hear it and then you kind of, I guess you realise how selective or kind of, you know, impressionable memory is really. So, um yeah, that was re really good fun. But uh, we did another one as well. Was that a White Snake track we did? Yeah, wasn't it, yeah. It? Ain't no I love mean, in the heart of the city. But I mean, I, I, I mean, I'd, I, I do a lot of file sharing and, and, and a lot of playing at home. Anyways, I've been doing it for years, so I guess that you know, playing is second nature. But it's when you've got to do a video at home. That's when it gets like a whole lot more stickers. Oh damn how could you know i'm going you know, in this space and what am i gonna do and i don't want it to look like me or you know just been on a normal day it's just really yeah so that's kind of generally a little bit harder but um we did so we did a couple of those um also i've been working on um a music community music project with jar wobble of like public image and jar wobble kind of uh Blast stuff, which has been happening in, in uh, we set up a music project in a South London library um, a couple of years ago, uh, where we did they they'd converted a reference section of a library into an art space. So we were doing we got a whole of the backline funded, and we've been doing jam nights in a library. So literally, as the library's closing, go in there, set up a load of backline whilst the last school kids are finishing off their homework, and then make a racket for a couple of hours. Um, then the plan with that was to, we've actually be, uh, been building a studio that Wes, Wes has been in to help us put that together. But literally, I think that the, the builders left the studio the week before lockdown or something, just as the cardboard boxes were arriving. But we, we were going to start running courses. So what we've been doing in the interim <clears throat> is running courses on Zoom uh, in affiliation with um, an adult education college in London, which has been really uh yeah interesting i haven't done teaching for a long time and then trying to figure out kind of where to get certain plugins working because because you know what technology have people got available we've got you know some people have got computers some have got pads some have only got telephones so we wanted to run some some kind of like workshop that was was inclusive um in that way but we've made quite a lot of music and we actually released a single on Cherry Red um, two or three months ago that got played on the BBC here and uh, the lead vocal was done into a telephone. So wow. that's, that's kind of... That's terrific. Are you finding any good talent out there in these workshops? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got some, we got, we got some mad regulars. So we, cause our age, age range we've got uh, is from 19 to 72 years old. Oh boy. So it's kind of, it's a real, real demographic. And, um, uh, and what well, I guess, I mean, the project's kind of aimed at more kind of middle aged guys. And I guess it's from a mental health kind of point of view, but it is good having kind of, you know, young female musicians on on the sessions that are able to tell her, you know, tell the older fraternity uh, kind of, you know, to be careful when they start cracking dad jokes or that kind of, you know, <laughs> borderline humour that's maybe unacceptable to the younger generation. Always good to get a reminder of that. So, Wow. <laughs> so, uh, how, you know, when you do things on Zoom, though, and you're doing a workshop, it's it's tough because you can't get instant feedback. You have latency to deal with. Yeah. So you can't play together. What no. What's that like? So, how well, I mean, well, I spent ages looking into that. And, and you know, I mean, there's still people saying that they can get some of this software to work. But everywhere officially that I've looked, you know, it looks like a real hack. 
to tr to get it to kind of possibly work and then mm. it's only possibly um, uh, and then also the issues with computer security at that point because of what you've got to disable to get that to possibly work the uh the we decided oh, we're just going to leave it you know hopefully it's for a limited period that we're doing it on zoom so i i, I run uh, logic or, uh, um on on mac and, and i found some some plugins that you can then put that into the zoom environment so that when i screen share i can put everyone inside logic pro and we so basically i said i i can set i file share mp3s of the homework and then we'll do a we'll do kind of lessons with different kind of videos or bit visual aids and stuff but then but then use the piece of music that we've started but you know and we'll just start it in a class you know deciding on tempo grab some loops send everyone an mp3 and then everyone will just send me all their contributions and then we'll arrange that together in classes so it's kind of more that way around so so we're not really you know we'd sidestep that issue of latency okay. it just a nightmare you know the tech's yeah. not maybe i mean from what i could make out uh, um my 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 favorite kind of computer guru friend he said that he 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 advised that maybe he'd leave the real time jamming till the quantum generation computers are in yeah <laughs> yeah probably true you know but you're giving everybody an opportunity to track and so they're really getting practice on what is real world uh stuff to do right now so that's yeah good. yeah no I, it's yeah, go ahead. No, sorry. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I play in. A, I play in. A, I'm here in California in yeah. uh, what we're terming uh, Bayview Studios Number Three. I just moved into this new place. It's got a beautiful view, and so uh, I, I try to I gravitate towards views. And this is Bayview Studio Number Three. But in my uh, musical life, I play in a British rock band. Called, oh wow! Yeah, called Uncommonwealth with a fantastic guitarist named Andy Brunt. And he is, he's the Londoner in the band that made us, fantastic. that made, that sewed up our shtick. So <laughs> I'm going to challenge him because I know he's probably watching right now that, uh, that he should join in on this thing and, uh, and cut a couple of tracks and get some feedback on it. Uh, and, and he is absolutely brilliant and a lot of fun to play with. And I'll shoot a shout out our other guitarist, uh, Doug Marcos, who, you know, we're playing all covers, so yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about when you dig deep into these covers to learn the parts and you start to pick the arrangement apart and really get an understanding for the song that you may have loved all your life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so that's a lot of fun. But, um, you know, between these two guys, they are they are doing a lot of guitar work that it, it's it's so much fun to play in a band with two guitarists. And then yeah. Ruben Brunt is our keyboardist and he is uh, he's he's also British. So he's oh, wow. British flair. Yeah. And he's, he's Andy's son. So I do that to shamelessly plug all of my bandmates. Um, now that's cool. So uh, can you give us some examples of your set list? Yeah, absolutely. So we play a lot of stones. We play stones. We play, uh, we, we do play Bowie. We play heroes. We play China girl. We play, um, rebel rebel. Um, yeah, and and uh, shucks, we play some Steelers Wheel. We play uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to ask you though to, to challenge me with a, a two guitar song that we ought to be playing in our set, so that those guys can do some homework and learn it. A British band. Yeah. Status uh, quo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, status quo, which one? Down, down. <laughs> well, uh, L London calling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's Doug commenting on the show right there. So we know that they're doing their homework. So there you go, guys. There's your challenge. <laughs> oh, we got. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I look forward to checking you guys out. Yeah. They are a lot of fun. I mean, they really are. One of the funny things was we had Chris Hughes on the show a little while ago, Chris Mary Hughes. And uh, John had a question for him, but he wasn't able to make the show. And what, what song was it, John, with the drum part? You're like, is there a cheat for this? It was and Everybody cool. Wants to Rule the World. You uh, know? Yeah. I mean, in that in that track, there's a there's a drum machine. You know, mm -hmm. there's a drum machine playing that that dotted eighth note triplet thing. And and yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm just tired. 
I'm trying to keep up with that thing and I get tired. And I'm like, hey, what's the hack? What should I be playing? Should I just go, you know, just play straight time? And 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 uh, and he just his answer was just play the damn song. <laughs> Uh, that, that that sounds like good wisdom. I mean, you, you, you do need to hear those kind of things from time to time, don't you? Yeah, I, I guess. I, I, I saw something on Instagram the other week. Um, um, I've been recently following Marco from Adam and the Ants, and he, he was playing with Shakespeare's sister just before lockdown. And there's some story about him saying that, oh, you know, Siobhan's a real talent, and great stagecraft but she gets all shiny says just just sing down the microphone <laughs> <laughs> and it is i mean you don't kind of you know we overcomplicate it sometimes don't sometimes we? we do need to hear those things <laughs> yeah. I'm, one of the questions i asked chris because i'm i'm we're starting to recognize you know the bands from your genre now like you know the b52s got in last year to the hall of fame um, oh, great. You know, and, I, and so it's starting to turn, you know, but how, how do you define like all of these post-punk genres, you know, big music, new wave, what, what is like some, you'll hear the Go-Go's they're going in this year. I think um, they're a standard rock and roll band, but because it's chicks, it was different. And there's a little bit of punk yeah. rock. Wave. What do you, how do you define it? I don't know. I mean, I mean, when punk exploded, I mean, it, it, it exploded in so many different directions. I mean, what post-punk? I mean, what, what did? Where did the new wave term come from? Was that an American? Um, I I seem to remember it kind of coming from America. The term new wave. I don't know who, which journalist. I'm assuming would have pulled that one out of the bag. Um, because I mean, what do we? We had stuff going off into from punk into right. well we had we had the scar reggae thing of two tone a couple of years later we had there was always a rockabilly thing kind of happening as well um there was all, all the different electronic stuff and then that whole blitz scene kind of kicked off uh oh dear, oh dear i don't know i mean and then, because I mean, when we started, we started the we started the Bat Cave in 1982, which is um, well, technically punk in the UK was the summer of '76. I guess in America, it would probably be a year or two earlier. CBGB's scene, yeah. Mm. But Lon London, it was the summer of '76, so '77 into '78 would have been kind of the more you know that, that would have been you know when the pistols albums out when the clash albums were happening or the damned records and the buzzcocks but then but then again with the buzzcocks they weren't a punk band for very long at right. all i mean they, you know they were quite elaborate kind of school musicians most of them so i don't know where power pop was a term that got thrown around here I think, and that was mainly the bands that were trying to become pop stars and make pop records, but had little thin ties, uh, but <laughs> but not not really safety pins, and you know, I don't know. We I suppose we all thought they kind of dressed looked a bit like their mum dressed them, but when we opened the Bat Cave, we were still being kind of influenced by very much kind of punk fashion but i guess a lot of punk punk fashion would have still come from the glam rock kind of thing Bowie, mm, yeah. you know the, the, the funny colored hair and makeup and bits of plastic and stuff but that fashion i mean an interesting thing that severin from the banshees wrote in i think that was in in john lydon's first uh, biography he'll say that one you know w when everyone kind of breaks down the you know the cultural or blah whatever side of the fashion of punk one thing that they keep forgetting is 1976 in england was an exceptionally hot summer it was unusually hot i mean i remember it was kind of like a drought i i can still remember i mean I was a teenager. I remember seeing it rain for the first time in months, and, <laughs> and this is this is England, you know. So that never happens. But that year, it was kind of like our LA weather, 
for maybe four or five months, which meant that all these kids are going to their punk shows and like cramming into a small sweaty room with their plastic bags and their safety pins on or whatever. So everyone started then cutting bits out of their outfits. So a lot of that stuff with the holes and stuff, it wasn't actually a fa- fashion statement as much as a practical ventilation. <laughs> Survival. <laughs> I've, I'm sure I've gone a million miles away from the question. It was a, it was a musical question, wasn't it? <laughs> John, has just, John has just destroyed punk cool. Oh, it was practical <laughs> ventilation. <laughs> it's nice. Love it. it. Wow. It was hot. Yeah, but that, that is sort of the question, though, is how do we get to like – so next week we have Jack Hughes on from, from Wang Chung. And, and other projects, you know, and you hear some of these music and you're like, that's absolutely on the money, new way of music. Um, you know, modern English, you hear certain songs, but then two songs down the list, you're like, well, that's not a new wave song. Like it's a totally different song. It's like a regular rock and roll song. And so it's really hard to put your, at least for me to put my finger on. I know it when I hear it, um, like defining punk, the clash for sure. Are punk, the Ramones are punk. Those bands are not at all like each other. I mean, there's no. all, other genres in clash really is a post-punk band where they did whatever the fuck they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it i mean they were making the next iteration of that band is is big audio dynamite and they made dance music you know like, yeah it's crazy yeah. Like, what i'm trying to wrap my hands around is just how do you take all these things Susie and uh, alice and Moye are, are out there duran duran all these different bands are taking rock and roll in a different direction whether it's new wave whatever genre it is but how do you define it without saying you you know when you hear it but how do you describe it without hearing it uh yeah well, well that's difficult i, I mean in, t- in terms of it actually happening i mean i, I know uh, in the uk there's it's always because the uk is so small and 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 and, and, and i guess in terms of ideas uh, moving, you know, ideas get tra- transmitted and received and mutated kind of really quickly. It's not like the USA where it takes like half a year to do a, li- a little tour around it. And by, and by the time you finish, it's almost time to kind of go around again. You know, mm. it's uh, the England's always turned a lot quicker and a lot quicker than, than our European neighbors. And I have a friend uh, that was a French record producer and he was saying that the stuff that they were producing in france he said oh you know we'd be able to guarantee that it would maybe sell have an idea that in germany it will sell this amount in italy will sell this amount said but in the uk we don't know if it you know would it sell twenty thousand copies would it sell five copies you know we did, didn't really kind of know because you know the fashion we could well with the infrastructure of you know you've got one national radio show playing daytime radio john peel was playing nighttime radio maybe we had radio luxembourg when we were kids going late night we had um, a melody maker new musical express and sounds three papers you know we've got you know bbc one bbc two and then wow independent tv came along at one point you know in those days it wasn't like you know we were also shocked when we got to america and it was what's that bruce springsteen songs 52 channels and nothing on <laughs> it's like yeah wow we just sat up all night just kind of you know doing all kinds of stuff just just watching all the nonsense that happened on american tv couldn't believe how you know how much fun it was well the public access as well because i mean yeah that was all kind of pre-reality tv wasn't it mm. i mean yeah you never saw anything kind of vaguely as kind of dangerous or iconoclastic you know in the uk because it was all you know kind of bbc kind of monitored and all very much above board but yeah. regulated yeah mm. Mm. Uh, I, I, I think mean, the other thing that you'll say about touring the u.s is by the time you make it all the way back around then the people in houston have forgotten about the pizza party incident and it's time to go back there it mm. is yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always loved touring around America. You know, it's the one place in the world where I knew I could get a fantastic breakfast every day, you know. Yeah. And, that's a, and that was the start of the day. So, and I've heard so many good stories from Hotel Barman in America, you know. It's, it's really, really was kind of something else, you know. Well, you opened a bat cave in New York, didn't you? Well, we, yeah, we did. Um, it was we did it over a couple of days or so that that was the first time i ever went to new york um because there was an english guy 
that was working out the dance satira, John Baker, Mole mm. was his nickname. And I can't remember, I don't even know how, how he got into contact with Ollie, but um, Ollie said, oh, quick, you know, we need to make some promo out. So kind of got the Xerox machine and kind of got, got some of our regulars over and we just kind of got all the glue and scissors and kind of made all these funny little handouts out with pop-up bats and sent them to New York. And they got a really decent budget for us. So they gave us the bottom two floors of the dance area, which was, was that 21st Street? 21st I think something like that, Man- Manhattan. And what they'd done is they'd, um, with the basement, they'd spray painted the whole basement black. And they said, well, look, here's a few grand. Here's two New York artists just kind of, you know, do your worst with it. And that was, because they were really talented, the two guys that we had. One was a really good spray paint graffiti artist. And the other guy was, was, he did kind of like classic sculpture and painting and stuff. So he said, well, yeah, what we want to do is, yeah, let's get a load of glow in the dark trees. They bought holiday trees and he sprayed them all glow in the dark. He made that, you know, different themed rooms in there. So one was, you know, a goth Jackson Pollock, kind of glow in the dark room another one was kind of you know the usual kind of drax with dracula thing with fireplace and big gothic paintings and chandeliers and then we had stuff when you open doors you know like a skeleton would kind of like come up the wall or a bat would come down and then we filled the whole thing up to about four foot high with dry ice it was like brilliant like acid trip kind of thing (laughs) <laughs> it worked really good because, and it really did kind of get a, a real buzz kind of going. We actually got a, um, a deal with Seymour Stein at Sire just on the basis of that one. So it just kind of, yeah. I think it ha- the right name, Ol- Ollie, Ollie came up with the name, the singer from Sesame for the Bat Cave. And he said that he was driving his car up past Abbey Road one day and the idea just landed on his head. And, and, and from the minute we had the name, the Bat Cave, everything was really obvious. Everything for the branding, well, these days you call it branding, but the graphic kind of... Um, All fell into you know, place. Yeah, yeah. It was so, it, so, And it also meant that then when we went to New York and stuff, it, they were easy ideas to kind of transmit with collaborators. So we we really got great. There was another guy that we found in New York that, um, well, there were a couple of people that I met, but one guy that uh, ended up making amazing props for us. And I know because he was working in club area, like in the next kind of generation of kind of New York club. Like, and, but he, he, he worked with John Carpenter on on kind of movies like The Thing and stuff. So that was the kind of quality of the people we were meeting. And there was another guy screaming Mad George, this crazy Japanese guy that I met. And uh, I'd seen some footage of his gigs at CBGB's and um, the, uh, the, hit the high point of his set was, so he had this kind of, kind of punk band they're all maybe maybe that was a new wave band all dressed in kind of white kind of judo karate suits and 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 then when he kind of be <laughs> building up to this moment in his set where he suddenly pull all his giblets out from under his shirt all his guts out and yeah because that's it he made stuff for movies and then he pulled his dick out and then got a big pair of scissors and chopped it off and that was like <laughs> the finale of his set and so, and I went round to his flat, and his flat was amazing. Where was that? Just kind of above the village, towards Midtown. It, it was real surreal. His flat had kind of man in bowlish, ha, man in bowler hat shaped doorways in it, and and he was making all these models, like again, like the stuff in carpet and movies. They were using all the compressed air guns to make things move. And mm. he showed me this video that he just made of a short film of a guy that gets up one day and starts having a shave and gets carried away, and then shaves all the skin off his face and then the rest oh. of his body and then ends up completely raw. And I'm kind of getting a bit grossed out and I'm not eating the pizza that they ordered earlier. But um, And then and he says, oh, let me show you my new model. He showed me the new model. So, so he's just showed me this gross out film and he accidentally cut his finger. Like, so like a tiny little bit of blood's come out and he fainted. <laughs> 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 ah, he can dish it out, but he can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> New York, was, New York was fantastic. That was like what was that eighty two, maybe beginning of eighty three. But... Oh, New York in the eighties. Mm. Wow. So was the hey. whole band out there at that time? 
Yeah, yeah. We I think the first trip we went out there for about maybe 10, 10 12 days. So we were there kind of for, for half a dozen days to set up the club for the show and just to go to go around Manhattan just creating havoc to promote it. I think we we booked one other show then at the east side in Philly. Uh and then and then we and then we did another one at CBGB's actually, mm. which and then that was the first time we ever got a gun pulled on us. So we, uh, we went to a diner just a few blocks up the Bowery after sound check. We were coming back, and this guy just like just came out of a doorway like this and just pointed this gun. It's like, "Hey guys, which one's gonna get it?" <laughs> we were just like, "Don't look, walk, walk, just walk, 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 walk." You know, just <laughs> totally crapping ourselves, and then went back to CBGB's and got. Totally wasted. I think it was a terrible set. So drunk after that. It was yeah. That was a bit. It was a bit. Welcome to America moment. <laughs> wow. Because I've heard I've heard some mad sto- specimen stories from America. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it, it was it was bonkers. Well, well we because we we were self managed. So so then when we went back. We went back out later that year on a tour, and um, and we took a PR guy that had been the editor of Zigzag magazine in the UK. We had Ollie the singer's sister that was a really good businesswoman doing our tour managing. She really managed to kind of get great things done. So yeah, but it was a bit kind of carnage, us kind of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> traveling around. I, I I wouldn't even really know where to start. I mean. Our drummer from that time, he says it's that's the tour that he measures every other tour on. <laughs> it was just, just so mad. Yeah, I mean, one there was one thing in LA as well. What was it? Um, I met this mad woman called Linda Cossey, who lived up in Beverly Hills, um, and she was filming the gigs at Perkins Palace, Pasadena, for Gary Tovar, the promoter. And uh, so it was like, hey, you got to go up and meet her and talk about the production for the film, for the show. And so, so we kind of turn up there and she's this insane woman, middle-aged woman with like, you know, with a daughter and a husband that she was getting divorced from at the time. And they had a fair light in the garage and she'd just been filming William Burroughs and was telling me all these stories about how he could black out video cameras. And there's a Warhol original portrait of her, uh, over the um, fireplace, and uh, but there's no electric lights going. There's only candles going in there. And she's saying, "No, I think electricity is really evil. I don't like electricity." So, was that, is that why you've got sixty-seven appliances in your kitchen? Then? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it just—it went totally mad with her. I mean, she she said, "I've I've I've got this video studio." Go down, we'll camp down there for a few days. We'll make a video. So we went. So there was this video, a uh, uh, little theater on Sunset. So we went down there. It, it was bonkers. She started inviting all these weird directors down that were trying to get off with the young boys in the band and stuff. And uh, and we ended up down there with no sleep for two days, and because she didn't seem to know what she was doing. And I remember falling asleep, and I woke. I woke up to the noise of like some kind of like massive road digger going and uh, she knocked a hole through the wall of the theater into the restaurant next door because she said she was hungry and uh, <laughs> yeah, so she literally just like would, and um i, I kind of got a bit freaked out actually it all it just it felt like it was all getting a little bit kind of weird so and she left i think i think i got one of the guys to come 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 over we shot a little bit of video and just and just got out of there a few months later we found out there was a thing in the la times talking about a punk party squatting john voigt's theater so apparently it wasn't even a theater wow <laughs> so when you say things like that tour was the one against which all others were measured what about that tour? I mean, what? How are you guys getting around? What? Tell us about the tour and the logistics and stuff that made it memorable. Because a lot of people don't yeah. understand those things. Uh, well, we had a little splitter bus. So we had um, a guy, Ron Ackerman, was our sound man that we got from. Uh, uh, for, where was he? He was he was a Philadelphia, and I don't I can't remember what his his background was. Did I? I always thought he was like I heard some story about him being ex CIA, but he was. 
he was really funny. So we had him doing our sound and a little driver called Art, who was the first person I ever saw with a little goatee beard and kind of like nerd, like looked like a grunge kind of guy in 1983 even so, so and he had a little splitter bus so we basically so the first part of it we were driving and interestingly enough you know i'd spotted i was you know big a big bowie fan i always loved um aladdin sane's one of my favorite ever, ever albums and i kind of realized well hang on that starts off at a new york party then it kind of had you know then it kind of heads up towards, you know, like North America and it's Panic in Detroit and all that kind of stuff. And and it's gradually getting a bit madder. And and, and then it gets to Cracked Actor and you're in LA and it all and the album gets totally disorganized and a bit insane at that point. So it was really it, I I had that in my guess because we just bought ghetto blasters on the trip before. That was literally the year there was the year that Double Decks came out. So we were all sat in New York, you know, recording Kiss FM off the radio and then bootlegging each other's tapes, making copies of that. And and I had kind of Aladdin Sane kind of going on all the way through driving up. So what it would have been doing what kind of Philly, kind of um, Boston, Boston Rat Club. Um, uh, the Toronto, Detroit, um, Chicago, to Minneapolis, and then maybe you took a plane from there. But um, yeah, it was it was odd. I think in Toronto uh, was it Larry's Bar? Our dressing room was in a brothel upstairs. That was really right. interesting. <laughs> then, then when we then when we got to um, Detroit. Um, the, the journalist that we had with us, Chris Nees, was a bit insane. He, he he was king of English toilet humor, and so backstage in our dressing room, there, there, was, there was a toilet in the corner, and 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 he was talking to it like most of the evening after our gig, and we we're like, Chris, you know, he was chatting up this toilet, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 well, 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 my new friend's called Trunky, you know. And so so that late, later on, we're on the bus. It's like, oh, I want to go in the bunk. It's like, oh, Chris, I can't get in the bunk. There's a bloody toilet in the bunk in the back of the um, the truck. So he basically adopted this toilet and brought it on our bus with us. <laughs> and so Trunky, the toilet... Ah, our little our little goatee beard driver hated it. I mean, there was one point where we drove away from the truck stop, and and Chris Needs was like, "No, no, no, no! Warning, warning! Trunky, he's left it at the truck stop, so we had to go back and get it." So we used to start our show with a little toilet in the middle of the stage with all the kind of coloured smoke coming out of it. And that was <laughs> kind of our Bella Lugosi kind of moment. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, this is where creativity really comes into play because I've had colored smoke coming out of my toilet a few times and I never thought to bring it on stage with me. Anyway. Yeah, but that's because you ate too much Mexican food, man. Yeah, never too much. I'm never too much. I know, I agree with you. <laughs> oh, too, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love Mexican food. Those are crazy stories, man. It's it's uh, that time in New York City, the explosion of punk and all that stuff, and just the redefining of what normal was. I mean, it's such mm. an incredible time. Um, would you change much if you were able to go back about what you did and the choices you made along the way? Boy, um, <laughs> it's kind of hard, actually. I mean, a, a few things kind of ha- happened to us. Our, our, our operation kind of exploded. Um, and it was a bit weird because I mean, it, we kicked off kind of better in, in the US than we did in the UK in a way, because in the UK it was very much synth pop by you know early eighties, and we really wanted to make a rock record. The first single, you know, the, the first single that we did was great. We did it, we did it with John Punter, who produced Roxy Music, and then we did kind of you know. So by the time we had our little mini album done, it, you know, it was never meant to be an album, actually. It was only because we did a couple of sing- single sessions. We disagreed with the label about the B-sides. So we did some extra tracks. And then they suddenly said, well, hang on, we can sell this as a mini album. And uh, uh, so, so it, it, but it meant that we were getting proper press then. So, and, and we were getting really nice reviews and, and, and really good, good coverage from kind of Rolling Stone magazine. So we just saw it as, as US was a way to get more into kind of the rock market. But it meant that we did end up kind of falling out with our label in England. We basically halfway through that tour, 
we just set our own we set our own sessions up in New York with a producer and just told our label that they were going to pay and they never ended up did pay and it was kind of that was one of the things that blew us out but there was also some bad behavior that backfired on us as well but like one member of our band had uh, tried to mail home someone's Christmas present from a Warner's office in San Francisco thinking thinking it was just kind of like general merchandise and, and, and it was and then, a bag or something what was it oh i don't know it's just some t-shirts but it was someone's christmas present and and that's because that see he'd been taught by our journalist friend in new york he said my journalist friend was this is how journalists survive you go to the record company and you, and you, chat, you chat up the secretaries and you go oh yeah no I, you know I, no, I love that artist, you know, I, I, I totally, you know, you know, I, I love Celine Dion. I'll take as many Celine Dion albums as you got. And then you get them all, get all these books of records, and then you get a taxi down a bleak of bombs, and you sell them all. So he, so Chris had taught some members of our band, that that's how you make your extra per diems. The problem was... When we got to Warner's office in Burbank, a certain nameless member of our band went up to uh, one of the secretaries in A&R and said, oh, there's a box of records in the corridor here. Could you please mail it to this address in London? And it was, uh, um, sadly, it turned out to be the head of A&R's personal record collection. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 basically so you imagine all this because you know we'd been really lucky we were dealing with with seymour stein directly you know and i was doing all the artwork and he was just like hey just do it yourself i'll pay for it and whatever and you guys really know what you're doing you know and and, and if your label or ever starts messing you around you need support come straight to me so that we there was a certain point when we were doing these recordings and our label was saying no 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 you should come back to london and and do a pop cover of something, you know. And uh, so we did go to Seymour Stein and say, Seymour, Seymour, you said you'd help us. Help. And at, at that point, so he put the word out and he, and he heard, heard about the T-shirts in San Francisco and the head in A&R's records in LA. And basically he got the word that they're trouble that lot. You don't want them in your office. So I think, so I think he just kind of watched our chart positions and when stuff didn't keep kind of, Climbing up the billboard chart, they were kind of like he was waiting wow. to hack. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, but you know what? When I chat to Ollie, sometimes we say, "Oh, crumbs." But if we had made it, if, if that band had made it in that situation with no control over us from any kind of level of management, did did. at least one of us would have been dead. <laughs> wow. Know, it was messy, but you know, it was just one of those things. You know, it wasn't meant to last, but. Wow, it was an amazing way to see America. I bet. Hey, so you've got, uh, let's see, you got a Telly back there, you got a Strat, and uh, I can't really see what that Gibson is back in the back. Maybe less. Oh, ball. no, that's, oh, that's, that, that's a Yamaha. Yamaha. Oh, is it a Yamaha? That's the heaviest guitar in the universe. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, which, which is cure, cure. And this one's really strange because it's, um, it's a 2100. And um, what happened, uh, I bought, because I got a 1000, which was the first one that I had with Specimen, because I, I was playing a Dan Armstrong plexiglass that time, but it got yeah. stolen. Oh. So I got one, of, everyone was using the Yamahas in the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, big country, uh, McGeeock and the Banshees was using them. Um, quite, and they had quite... They had kind of, they're a bit screechier than a Les Paul. They've kind of definitely got a bit more of a metallic kind of noise. So I was looking for one in 2008 when we were doing our Back Cave 25th anniversary. Um, and Martin, the old keyboard player from the Banshees, he said, Oh, I've got one. And like the guy, the, I bought it on eBay, and the guy said it used to belong to a big band. And I said, Oh, well, just hang on a minute, let's have a look at it. And it turns out it was the same one that we bought in my first week in the Banshees from the rock shop in Camden. And I, and I, and I, noticed, I noticed the same one because I think the first time we turned up to a TV show to mine, I had that and I didn't have any plectrums. And I asked our bass tech, I said, oh, I've got a plectrum I can borrow. He said, I've only got severins and they're metal. And, and, and because when you're miming, you're, you do, 
it, you're not playing properly. And at the end of the show, it was scratched to bits, this brand new guitar. Oh. So that was how, but well, that's how I kind of identified that it was the same guitar. But yeah. it's, it, it's, it's great. I mean, it's just got a slightly different kind of, I've been using it on some stuff um, lately that I'm trying to get kind of a bit more like late seventies kind of sounds. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 if if it's a heavy guitar, you were used to the weight anyway from playing the uh, that acrylic guitar, because those things were heavy too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not so much into kind of heavy guitars these days, but I don't know. I mean, I've been also learning to play a, a seven string in lockdown. Oh yeah, which has been really interesting because I mean, I suppose most of the seven string that you see is all kind of metal, but I've actually been using it to overdub really interesting parts on more kind of cinematic stuff that I'm doing where you want just big low power chords, like kind of pads almost. And the way that you riff on a seven string is really different. It's kind of different kind of positions and the way that it messes with your peripheral vision, even though, because it's six strings the same as the normal guitar with the one on the bottom, but that confuses everything in my brain. So I think it's kind of, it's so the additional, the seventh string is a low B. Uh, yes, yeah, a low B, which I'll drop down to an A. Mm. Okay. And that does throw everything off. I was going to ask, is there one axe that you reach for more than the others? Oh, God. Um, that Stratocaster, actually. That Strat is awesome. Ah. <laughs> one of my favorites. Uh-huh. So that I bought that from Guitar. This one came from um, Guitar Center in uh, Dallas, in 95 so i think that was they were stevie ray vaughan yeah up. but uh my friend sent it over and she got him to put a jeff beck in the back i mean it's mm. a shame that i can't switch it it's just hardwired as a humbucker in the back but it, re it really does i mean you know it's, it's it is the nicest kind of strat i've played so it kind of sits in between everything else and you know, so it, it just plays really well. And I guess it's the one that's normally hanging on the wall next to me. So mm. whenever I'm working, if I grab a guitar, it's more often kind of that one than, than something else. So. Okay. But well, you know. brought up Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Beck. So I'm going to say this. Sometime around 90, I think it was 93, Jeff Beck had an album out called Guitar Shop. Yeah. And I went oh, to go see that really? tour. Yeah, right. <laughs> I went to go see that tour and I went to see Jeff Beck. But the opener, the show that I went, and they leapfrogged, just like you guys did on Lollapalooza, but they leapfrogged it. The opener that night was Stevie Ray Vaughan. But I went to see Jeff Beck, and I love Jeff Beck. But that night, Stevie Ray Vaughan whooped his ass. I mean, we walked away from that show going, what on earth did we just, we just saw a whooping? And yeah. it, it, it didn't, I was there with three other guys, and we, you know, all just music nerds, and we were flabbergasted at what we saw. So between the two of those guys, who do you like? Well, well, I mean, like you, I like both of them, both of them, and yeah. kind of like both of them for different reasons. I mean, I guess yeah. you know, I became aware of Stevie Ray Vaughan with Let's Dance Bowie, I suppose, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and I don't think I fully appreciated him at that point. I was always into Bowie guitar players, so I studied kind of all of them. Sure, I was, but I kind of I was. Really, I, I loved Ronson for his melodic playing, but the experimental yeah. players like Ballou that had come from Zap, Zappa and stuff, I loved and Fripp. But um, yep. Stevie Ray Vaughan, the more and more I listen to him, the more I like him. And, and, and the one thing I really come to love about him is just the visceral power in his yeah. playing. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. unparalleled. The visceral power and the... Because he's wasn't he the well, the story, I don't know is that true or is it an urban legend that he used to put super glue on his arm and then stick his fingers to it and pull his skin off for his fretboard hand because his strings I've were really that. heavy and, he, and ah. he used to wear, wear them out. But you know his tuning was so solid, wasn't it? Yeah. With, yeah. And, and 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 that which kind of brings me to the only thing that sometimes with Jeff Beck, I mean I love Jeff Beck, he's an incredible player. He's so articulate, and, and he was yes. so good from early on. But that sometimes I'm kind of thinking, it's a bit out of tune now, isn't it? 
<laughs> you know, it's 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 got its little, little pinky whammy bun, and it and it is incredible. I remember the first time I saw him. What was the solo on on that Roger Waters album? Uh, amused, amused to death. Yeah, that was like, oh my god! I think that's yeah. the best. That's the best thing he's ever done. Wow! You know how to say yeah. something with one note. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. Or, um, but there, and there was another. What was that? There was a video in the eighties that I loved. What was that track? Was that was that been? Was that before the uh, the guitar uh, shop album? As, as an MTV video of it's like him doing an audition of singers and stuff. Uh, I don't know. Oh. So all these people turning up, and he's playing. It's, I don't remember. He's got a bright orange guitar with a white scratch plate. That is the playing that one was killer as well. So yes, I don't know. It's hard though, isn't it? It's mm. yeah. That's what made it a whooping was the visceral power. But that's what I get from Stevie. Is Stevie like, Ray Vaughan's playing his guitar and it's got fourteens on it, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> just big heavy cables for strings. Yeah, and it, you, yeah, you can't you can't really compare. Yeah, well, I mean that's interesting. I mean, I I, I was always interested because what well, I love Billy Gibbons, you know, and then what he was. I saw a thing the other day where he was talking about using sevens, and wasn't it some old blues player that that taught him how to use light light strings? Up? Hey, why are you working so hard, boy? <laughs> yeah, BB King. Yeah, yeah. He tells that story in, in the life of Daryl's house when he plays. It's that's great. it. Yes. Yes. Oh, I, I mean, but I mean, it doesn't matter what string gauge he plays. Doesn't matter what he plays. It just sounds. Then Billy Gibbons sounds so much like Billy Gibbons. I mean, I love yeah. his, his 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 little kind of um, chicken picking licks. I mean, they're they're really. I just love his sound, but I don't know. He he can just do dirt like no one else, can't he? he really, really <laughs> swamp. But, but curiously enough, in terms of string gauge, I saw a thing on uh, Rick Beato's show a while ago, where they were trying, they were, tr- they were trying to um, uh, debunk the myth that heavier strings make a guitar sound better. And he was saying, "Whoa, you know, we have a new theory that nines sound more ballsy when you record them than tens do." And I was like, "No." <laughs> You just ruined the last 30 years of my life. Yeah. <laughs> ten, uh, ten stay in tune better. <laughs> well, we have truly nerded out today. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah. We're, uh, we're, we're coming around the home stretch here. What do we want to plug before we walk away? What do we want to plug? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let that question be the stumper. <laughs> half yeah. pigeon, half dove. Half dove, half pigeon. Yeah, it was hard. I just, well, I just, I've just been working on an album, but I've been sworn to secrecy on it, so I'm not allowed to say. All right, anything. all right. <laughs> but um, yeah, half dove, dove, half pigeon is the one that we did with the Mellotronics, and yeah, there's a few other things. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, hmm, I have to think about that (laughs) okay well now whatever whatever it is you're doing we we find you know nowadays it's not just the latest thing everybody finds everything on the web and uh, they can go to your back catalog and they can refresh their memory with the stuff that you've given us and you've given us so much over the years that i just wanted to say uh thank you on behalf of our listeners and 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 on myself and thanks for challenging the guitar players in my band and uh thanks for sitting with us (laughs) we really appreciate it yeah, and Wes, as always, you know, thanks for bringing John. I mean, and, I think I'm, I'm going to put some more music up online soon, actually, because, okay. yeah, I don't really, I, there's a lot of my stuff that I don't have out there anywhere now. I and mean, I think enough time has passed to possibly start refiling it. I mean, I do that with my, some of my filmmaking more than I have done with my music. But I think since lockdown, and that's actually kind of true of a lot of people I know, a lot more. People I know are making a lot more music in the last year than they've made 
probably in the decade before. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a lot of activity out there. And some of the stuff that I've been doing is learning how to play songs of mine that I've never, I've released, but never learned to play. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going to start kind of getting some of that yeah. stuff. Up on. So I'll let you know. Terrific. Well, I'm I'm comfortable speaking for Pete and say, and saying that look, consider us members of the John Klein Army. Whatever you're doing, we're doing with you. So anything we can do to promote and help, please count us in. And and man, thank you so much for all the music and for sitting with us today. Oh no, absolute pleasure. And no, that's been great fun. <laughs> <laughs>